really excited to have you on the podcast today. Uh, so you just have an insane background, like having worked at the NSO Group and then recently making the switch uh, to become an auditor in Web3 security. And I just can't wait to hear some of your thoughts and insights around this, like um, also learn more about your journey from uh, being an exploit developer um, into uh, independent security researcher in this space. and. Uh, yeah, you're, you're not really a bit of a morning person, so um, probably due to all the late night hacking sessions. But thanks for joining me. It's going to be an interesting conversation. Yeah, um, lovely to be here. Uh, thank you for inviting me. And yeah, I'd like to talk and like uh, tell you anything you'd like to hear about uh, like uh, whatever, what I'm doing, what I'm planning to do, and like any kind of uh, questions you may have about uh, like background or general tips for new guys. So yeah, I'm, I'm open to talk about uh, anything. Awesome, awesome. Uh, so why don't we, like a lot of people, I know they want to understand your audit process and all that, but before we go uh, dig into that, um, I want to talk a bit about your background because you have a super interesting background. Um, uh, you, you must have started like tinkering around with tech and hacking stuff when you were really young because you went into the IDF and then you um, started doing research and development um, in the IDF. So uh, did you start really young, like into the space? Yeah, well, my dad taught me programming very young age, and I went to like some kind of like uh, extracurricular uh, schools where you learn programming and like uh, develop your mathematical intuition and stuff like that. And I was always always inter interested in physics and mathematics and computer science, um, mostly from an algorithmic background. The, my interest in security came kind of later. Uh, but yeah, um, during high school, I competed in some computer science Olympiads and reached the uh, final stages. And I really enjoyed taking a very algorithmic uh, and analytical look at uh, code and seeing like uh, what's the best way to do like, to solve certain problems. And also develop. I did like uh, quite a bit of like developing games and websites. So. Yeah, like when the teacher taught, taught us how to do like really kind of boring stuff in Java, I wrote a game instead and uh, got people more excited about it, like the other classmates. Um, so yeah, I was always looking to do like a little bit beyond uh, what, the, what, what was like expected of us in that kind of stage and kind of explored my own journey. Nice, nice. Um, so you started pretty young, um, got fairly technical into algorithms and computer science and then after high school um, you went straight into the IDF is that right yeah after basically in high school you start like getting drafted to the military and you see like where is the best fit for you and uh, I, I was interested already going into high school to get to land a, a role in the intelligence forces because I've heard it's going to be like extremely interesting and um, there are so many like uh, new technologies involved and it really set you up for uh, the tech sector later. Uh, so uh, I did some fair bit of preparation and like really got into more security and networking, uh, basically like understanding more uh, of the kind of concept that I wasn't aware of beforehand. And um, basically I got recruited to the army, uh, to, to the intelligence forces. Um, and basically had four and a half years of extremely interesting um, experiences over there. So m basically most of what I was doing, I can't really share, but the overall the, the depth of knowledge that's required to do these uh, like kind of uh, research and development uh, roles um, is amazing. And you're always surrounded with um, amazingly talented people um, that are passionate about what, what we're doing and are trying to, you know, bring from themselves the very best and solve what should be impossible challenges, but actually they, they could be solved potentially. And yeah, th that's basically where I spend like a good part of my, um, like where I got the education from, like in reverse engineering and low level uh, hacking, that's basically where um, I was able to get a very good grasp of all these concepts. Right. Yeah, that sounds like an amazing learning experience there. 
Um, so is that how it pretty much um, how it works in Israel? So you graduate from high school. Most people will do like um, several years in the military. Um, you get to choose like whatever like um, topics that you're interested in there and then uh, apply uh, to that particular role. Is that right? Yeah, so there's all sorts of uh, roles in the army. Uh, everyone needs to do something unless like they get uh, some they have a special reason. But uh, you can spend your time uh, uh, doing like anything gen- like generic that the army chooses for you, or you can apply for like special uh, roles ahead of time. And these kind of get resolved during your final high school year, like uh, to, to where exactly you're going. So this uh, like interview and. Uh, like CTF process and that kind of stuff all went down uh, in the final year and um, and yeah I, I scored high enough to be able to get like uh, to do what I wanted to so joining the cyber school academy and joining a later a very technical uh, division so yeah and basically everyone does it and in order to do that you have to um, basically uh, commit a certain number of extra years uh, to the army in order for it to, uh, you know, uh, get you this really awesome role and um, basically they have to uh, uh, dedicate a lot of resources into your training and so on. So uh, it kind of makes sense that they kind of require uh, an extra year and a half from, that's what I, that's what I served. Um, and actually I know that um, later on after I got released, like this uh, extra ser- uh, serving time uh, got increased to two and, half, and two and a half years and sometimes even three years. So I was kind of lucky enough to not uh, commit too much time to it and move on to uh, uh, new challenges. Right. Yeah, sounds pretty exciting. Uh, was it really like a rigorous process um, in terms of recruitment? Was there like a lot of people trying to get in because cyber is pretty big in Israel? Yeah, it was already kind of big there, and it's only gone uh, much more competitive since then. Um, I was actually uh, uh, an instructor in the cyber school uh, in my unit, and basically you can see that every year like people were getting better and having more prior knowledge. And you know, maybe uh, if I tried to join this uh, unit uh, two and a half years later, I wouldn't have made it because things got even more competitive, and you know, um, there is a certain buzz about it and. People are like uh, parents are trying to get their children to this uh, kind of industry very early on. So, yeah, you can kind of feel uh, this buzz uh, and how it's impacting like people's knowledge and experience before even starting, you know, uh, adulthood. So your parents sort of got you. Did did they have a a sort of future imagined out for you? That's why they got you into like algo and computer science uh, pretty early? Mm, I, I wouldn't say so. Um, my parents never like uh, pushed me into a cer- certain specific field. It was mostly my interests and what uh, uh, what kept me like fueled up and going. Uh, I really tried to do that uh, and you know become like uh, fill in the gaps of my knowledge and know like what's interesting for me to study and. Yeah, my parents, they always provided the tools and support, but they, they didn't actually tell me what, what was like supposed to be my future or anything like that. Yeah, so they, they pretty much just wanted you to get into tech, but they didn't really have like a set uh, outline for you. And it was more your interest that um, sort of drove you towards um, cyber and offensive security research. Yeah, it was always super exciting for me to like... Uh, think about this field and how um, it's, it's all about like a battle of wits and you, you, like there's certain rules in the game and you have to break those rules using the the car, like whatever is already there like you can't uh, do like hack out of thin air right you have to understand the system really deeply so that was real that was kind of uh, what drove me into this bit, uh, like line of work yeah it's uh, never a dull day in this line of work yeah, definitely. Uh, so you went into offensive security research at the IDF. Um, done that. Was that for four and a half years? Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I spent some of it like uh, doing different roles, but uh, they were all centered around research and development. And like you know, there's all sorts of uh, very unique opportunities that you can only do as in an, like a nation state, uh, well-funded uh, sort of uh, operative unit. So. 
the kind of things that you can't do at home or in a small hacking group. So it was really awesome to have this opportunity to be part of a really important task uh, task force, you know, like the, the kind of impact that you have that uh, makes your country more secure is, is pretty awesome. Nice. Awesome. Awesome. Sound, sounds like a really good learning opportunity there. And uh, obviously you learned a lot. And then after um, your uh, service at the IDF, you uh, moved on to doing exploit development at Dojo Labs and then NSO Group um, after that. So did you pretty much like got, get, got your training in terms of like exploit development at the IDF because you were you know, able to get a job straight out after that um, at a you know, exploit development place? Yeah, so um, I got like the all the education or the basic uh, understanding that was needed uh, already in the IDF, and then um, I really wanted to keep doing um, uh, vulnerability research and exploitation. And this part, and at this point, um, I was already ready to do those kind of uh, roles outside, and I decided to join a Dojo, which was a pretty small startup, which did uh, IoT security. Uh, it's already been uh, acquired by another company since then, but um, the role was basically to take your everyday uh, consumer IoT devices and try to show how we can break them apart and uh, sh- and exploit them. So it was very autonomous and gave me like uh, uh, an opportunity to show my skills. It wasn't as much uh, learning from other people there. Uh, the, we had a couple of other uh, security researchers, but um, basically I was the only one tasked with like finding new bugs in uh, consumer IoT devices. And we had a lot of uh, cool successes there. Uh, we like It was also an opportunity to share it and increase the, my exposure and uh, in terms of being able to share uh, the sort of uh, tech um, and hacking I, I'm able to do. So after um, doing something in the intelligence where you, obviously you can't share it, this was actually kind of fun to uh, get your name out, uh, get some CVs under your belt and share you know, your findings in conferences and so on. So it was really interesting and a great opportunity and we we broke into some cool security cameras and uh, um, Amazon smart doorbell and some routers uh, so it was cool had a lot of fun there yeah I, I saw you had a bunch of CVEs under your name uh, was that during your time at Dojo yeah that was like the only time where I was doing public research uh, and yeah we find some cool. We found some really cool stuff there, and actually, um, there were some other challenges that uh, are only possible in this kind of like uh, embedded or IoT devices, um, because um, in uh, in usually in these kind of projects like maybe in, uh, mobile or desktop or uh, browser hacking, so you have the firmware and or the software and you just uh, study it and. And find exploits, but here you actually have to. It's it's actually quite a challenge to even get the code that's running on the system, right? So, you we had a hardware hacking lab, and we extracted the code using all sorts of techniques from the firmware, uh, and it was just like another part of this challenge where you even before the journey begins of uh, like uh, finding bugs, you have to get the code out. Um, yeah. And also, there's some crazy people that are able to do some hacking without, uh, like, blind, without the code. Uh, and that was also really interesting to see other people. Like, uh, they have these uh, some cool uh, vid- videos out about uh, them doing it. But, uh, yeah, I really wanted to have a look at the code first. Nice, nice. Yeah, I guess that definitely translates very well to smart contract auditing. And uh, for auditing, I guess it's easier because we, we, we get the code straight away. You don't really, really need to do any reverse engineering for that. Yeah, it, it feels um, like a little bit on easy mode at the start because like, hey, I used to be able to do this on code that's assembly uh, and now you get the nice solidity files. Uh, so in a, in a way, it is a little bit on easy mode and part in, in the way that you understand the uh, the developer's intentions uh, quite quickly, but it, it also requires a lot of uh, creativity and other challenges which didn't exist in like my other uh, roles because um, 
this, this field is so uh, expensive and um, contains a lot of different interactions with technologies, you know, like uh, interacting with external smart contracts and understanding what, what's available uh, uh, as, a, as an attack tool and, and like how to exploit contracts. There's actually so much more uh, dynamic, so many more dynamics involved. Uh, so it's really a kind of place where you creativity can shine and looking for very cool edge cases um, might even be more of a challenge than in other platforms. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So so there are yeah definitely some unique challenges to smart contract auditing and like the bug classes in smart contract auditing is completely different to traditional uh, security. So you have to um, sort of learn a whole new way of doing things in terms of smart contracts. Yeah, there's uh, there's mostly a lot of new uh, bugs and like people are even inventing new bug classes as we speak sometimes and it's really um, that's kind of what got me pretty excited about Web three security is like we kind of, we kind of learning it on the fly it's not like uh, well established yet and um, you know we can have very long term impacts by the way we secure our code and set up the best uh, practices for the future. Yeah, um, definitely. Like Web three, it feels like the cutting edge. Where we're like right at the edge of um, you know this new boom in technology that's um, that's going to take place. So it's a pretty exciting industry to be in. Uh, so you you mentioned that you, um, at Dojo Labs you were like mostly just doing like research and uh, probably like a lot of self directed research, uh, right? Um, I saw some of your posts on Twitter. You you always recommend people to do their own research um, when it comes to a learning and improving. Um, was that where you sort of developed that um, approach to self-learning um, during your time at uh, Dojo and maybe NSO Group as well? Yeah, um, I, I believe uh, self-directed learning is really important. You need to have that capacity and uh, it's something that you, you need to be able to do and no one's going to teach you how to do it. But uh, um, it's some kind of skill that really uh, pays off and uh, I think I got most of these skills from the army because like what you get taught in the in the cyber school boot camp is like uh, you have to solve these challenges by yourself and you have like sometimes you don't even have an internet connection in the classroom and you have a challenge you just like break your head and um, read the docs again as many times as necessary or open up uh, uh, start reverse engineering even like the tools you use to get a deeper understanding of them uh, and basically what, what you what you're kind of uh, taught or brainwashed is that any challenge is like solvable if you try hard enough and this is the kind of mentality that if you bring forward to like uh, new projects that um, that kind of uh, like confidence and motivation it's it kind of goes a long way into making it a reality um, Obviously, not everyone has the same like starting point, and uh, some people which don't have background, it's going to be much harder for them to solve these problems, uh, or uh, uh, different like people with different uh, like uh, uh, types of intelligence. So maybe uh, deep analytical uh, intelligence really serves a long way in solving this problem, but like other more uh, artistic people will have a harder time with uh, these kind of challenges. But um, I do think that. Uh, once you, you have your ability to self-learn and uh, you, you, you can ask other people questions, but you always need to have the ability to like, figure it out by yourself. And that really uh, gives you the ability to go on paths that uh, maybe no one else has gone before and make that little bit of uh, contribution to the field that uh, previously like no one was actually there. And that's kind of what really excites me as well. Like, being the first person to like do something uh, and find certain uh, certain type of exploit, uh, and you can only do that by being able to do it like do your own research, and only absorb uh, uh, motivation and uh, ideas from others, but not the ability to dive deep by yourself. Right. Yeah. That that sounds like a really awesome mindset to have drilled into you uh, during your time at the IDF. Yeah, I think so too. Um, and it's mostly the, the, the barrier is usually in your head. Like, 
I, I've seen it with like some of my students also like in the mentorship in, uh, I'm running like uh, once you give people like the the idea that they are they can do it by themselves then suddenly they're they're actually much more much more uh, potent than what they thought and much more independent so I would say everyone just uh, try to give yourself the this challenge and see where where it lands you nice nice and then um, after Dojo Labs, you worked at NSO Group for two and a half years. Uh, can you give us like a bit of um, understanding of what it was, what was like to work there? Because, you know, obviously um, everyone who's not living under a rock will know of the NSO Group and the Pegasus um, and all that. So, yeah, like uh, what, it was, what was it like to work there and uh, what was your experience? Yeah, NSO was definitely a blast to work in. Um, it's unlike uh, other companies I've worked in, and definitely not like the army. Um, it feels like you're at the center of attention as a researcher there. Um, really, the, the entire company is built on your um, discoveries and your ability to like, hack into uh, mobile phones. Uh, not in, on an individual level, this was much more of a group effort than my experiences in Dojo. But... Uh, yeah, you, basically you have like a team which with very, very um, uh, skilled, uh, uh, like a set of very nice uh, and useful talents and they're able to uh, help you and also uh, we split up the work and like each of us is maybe responsible for different parts of this uh, exploit chain and I can say like on, on a more general level, like the NSO really... Uh, tries to keep uh, everyone very happy and uh, thinks about the tiny details of like how to make your day to day better. Uh, you have like a very like a personal assistant that um, if you need anything that they she can help you or uh, like resolve any issues you have. Um, you you know you have like this amazing kitchen. You have um, like uh, maybe every couple of months like some fun activity you do together with other people and yearly uh, vacation, like a group, uh, uh, company uh, retreats. Uh, and this is also about like, kind of building a, a story about uh, like being able to solve massive challenges. And in iOS, we were very, very close together. I, I was working primarily in the iOS uh, exploits and we really uh, became sort of a small family, you, can, you could say and you know you know everyone and uh it's more like of you get your motivation from basically uh seeing the success rather than like you, you don't think about your paycheck or like the conditions or anything like that you know you just like you want to make it work because it's important for you it's like it's a very hard mental challenge and also you're part of a team and you always want the team to win right if you if you manage to get uh, researchers on board and feeling like it's a team effort then they can bring out their best uh, their best talents sounds pretty amazing so it almost feels like a you're working on a passion project and it's that challenge that you really crave and love uh, while you're working there yeah it felt like that quite a bit and obviously in a, in a like from a professional perspective, it's one of the like toughest challenges on the planet. Like uh, smartphones are very, very mature sec uh, security-wise. Uh, there's already very strong uh, mitigations and uh, sandbox models, and it's definitely very. It's it's as far as apart from Web three as you can imagine in terms of maturity, right? Uh, um, so it makes it even a, a larger challenge and. Uh, it it's also makes it a greater sense of achievement when you do get like some successes on the way. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's very different. Yeah. Um, and how would you say like the difficulty of um, exploiting Android finding zero days um, and that compared to Web3 security? Because obviously like, traditional security is much more mature and 
um, from my understanding, right, you, you have to be specialized in just one particular part of the exploit chain. And then you've got different people specialized in each part. And you have to really like combine all those parts and all of those parts have to be working to be uh, able to come up with just the one single exploit, right? But in Web3, it's like you, you can just come up with it by yourself. Um, so uh, how would you like compare the difficulty um, of uh, each? Yeah, I mean, you're definitely right about that. Um, there is basically the, the space is much more explored uh, in Web3 from both uh, an offensive and defensive uh, perspective. And that makes it much more of a challenge to do any small like uh, um, breach or privilege escalation, right? So uh, you can have like a team that's all about getting at the initial uh, bug that gives you some kind of uh, a buggy behavior in the process. And then you can have another team which gives you uh, like it, and its challenges to get you out of that very restrictive uh, conditions and give you a higher privilege, maybe even get in, into uh, the root uh, and uh, control like uh, execution from the kernel. Uh, and also like these kind these new mitigations that have been introduced in the last uh, three, four years have been extremely hard to solve, you know, uh, you could say that the defenders got much more of a better understanding what what, what uh, the hackers are using and basically got to the root of the issues, like what what, what is giving uh, attackers this uh, extra uh, freedom or um, convenience that can translate a bug to an exploit. And they've kind of uh, introduced some very hard mitigations which stop you early on uh, from doing something meaningful. So I could say that mo uh, like, it's, it's become less and less about bugs. I mean, bugs will always be there, but it's also about like, how do I use this uh, bug to like, wh what are the different uh, uh, mitigation bypasses that I need to chain uh, to reach this uh, like high, like, uh, control of execution or my uh, target goal. So there is so much more involved. Um, where the, when in Web3, it's extremely logical. And once you're able to do something that you're not supposed to, then usually it, it can lead to uh, a loss of funds or a freeze of funds or uh, some kind of uh, uh, freezing of a smart contract. Uh, so basically the, the um, gap is almost non-existent between the bug and how to use it uh, and it's all about preventing the bugs in the first place in web3 right and yeah it definitely sounds more difficult i mean i mean to me it sounds more difficult um finding a zero day in ios um, for example uh you know just because of how you know as they release more patches you're more and more constricted in what you're able to do um, and in Web3, it's still very new, I feel, and yeah, new bugs coming out, and then and developers, they're less mature in Web3 um, than compared to you know, iOS, obviously. Yeah, um, I think every time technology is evolving in a rapid pace, it's very good for attackers because, uh, because there's never really maturity. Once something is mature, then something new comes and is the new. Uh, uh, immature uh, technology. So as long as we keep on uh, like inventing new protocols and uh, not uh, stabilizing on a specific uh, uh, protocol, and then it's kind of always going to be like a lot of learning uh, as we go and making mistakes as we go. And that always gives the uh, hackers opportunity to find it before defenders do. Um, like you can say that Linux kernel is extremely mature and it's it's uh, basically you can see that there is they've continually fixed bugs but even though there there's a lot of bugs are fixed and code is much more mature um, they still introduce new features to the kernel and this the, and and this way um, bugs can be introduced as well so uh, more generally in this uh, software field you we, we kind of don't like to stick with with what we already have and that's the kind of uh, problem uh, overall with security, right? Because you can't introduce new features without introducing new bugs. And if you stay with the same thing, then like uh, you can't have uh, new features, new optimizations and so on. So it's kind of um, it's a trade-off that we have in software. 
Right. Yeah. It sounds like you are pretty passionate about Web3 and uh, it being an, a, m a more immature uh, field. You're able to like find more bugs, like be at the cutting edge of, of technology. Uh, can I ask, like, is that the reason why you decided to switch uh, into Web3 security? Because like, I, I know a lot of like traditional cyber folks, right? They, they're pretty entrenched in what they do. And if they reach a pretty high level in what they do, they, they don't really want to switch or learn new technologies. They're just like, yep, yeah, yeah, I'm fine where I am, you know, um, um, I don't want to learn this blockchain stuff, sounds like scam anyway. Uh, so for you, um, you are pretty high level in um, what you do already. And um, in terms of monetary, you're probably getting paid pretty well already there um, at NSO Group. So what was your motivation um, to actually switch from what you were doing before um, into um, Web3 security? Um, well, I can say that it happened in a couple of steps. It wasn't like uh, specifically uh, leaving NSO with uh, the intention of my, in mind to move to Web3 security and do independent uh, auditing. Uh, it wasn't quite like that. It, it was more of a, a conscious uh, decision to leave NSO in January from like different uh, reasons. Uh, I did want to go independent and explore uh, options to maybe like found my own company, like traditional security company or offensive security company. Um, I, I didn't have a specific uh, like, uh, goal in mind in terms of what I would be building, but I did want to do something independent. Uh, and one of, and there were a couple of reasons why I decided to leave NSO. Uh, it wasn't because of the technological uh, interest, because I mean it was it was still very interesting, and you had a lot of uh, new challenges over there. And like I definitely could have done a lot more and uh, kept it really interesting, but uh, I, I did feel like uh, there were certain uh, uh, transitions and changes in the company which didn't exactly uh, suit my uh, uh, m my wills and uh, what I expected from the company, and I did decide to, to move on because. Uh, um, there's so many opportunities and I decided to do something uh, like um, more independent and you know like after having like a year and uh, having this experience before and I knew that I would be able to do something uh, whatever I came to to do it I'd probably be able to grasp it pretty quickly and uh, uh, maybe set like found a company with a couple of friends or something like that so I wasn't so it was more of a decision, first of all, to leave NSO. And, and then I started exploring different uh, opportunities. Uh, it did feel like the offensive security field in Israel is going to be very tough. And, and basically, uh, founding your own company is, uh, is going to be really tough because of the regulation perspective. And uh, there were a lot of changes in that field. So that kind of demotivated me to, from building my own NSO or so, something like that. Um, and I did start hearing more and more about Web3 in April uh, of this year. Uh, friends were excited about it and I wanted to like, uh, see what's, what it's about. And I saw like these massive bug bounties which just came out, right? Like uh, Wormhole uh, and uh, MakerDAO and all sorts of uh, big bounties. And I, I started reading more about them and like seeing is there really uh, like uh, how mature is this uh, security field uh, in Web3? And um, I kind of came to realize that there is a massive shortage in, uh, in talent in this field, right? Because technology is, is uh, advancing in a rapid pace. Uh, but a lot of people are still in the mentality, like you said, of, hey, I'm really good at what I'm already doing. So why change? Why learn this new, maybe scammy technology? So... They, there aren't enough uh, good people in this uh, in this space and for me I, I've never been afraid to try out new platforms right I, I've moved uh, from uh, very specific uh, challenges in the IDF to uh, IOT and then to mobile um, it's actually quite exciting for me to learn new platforms uh, and I, I do have the, the confidence that uh, uh, the skills that are actually really required do translate from field to field. So I would be able to pick up on these sort of uh, challenges. So once I kind of convinced myself that uh, this was a really cool uh, place to uh, explore 
uh, I started reading audit reports and like uh, bug postmortems, and it was kind of clear that there there are there's definitely going to be bugs here. It's just like a matter of uh, who finds them first, and um, that kind of convinced me to to join the field. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you only started learning Web3 security in April. That's crazy how fast um, you were able to pick things up. Um, probably like due to your background in hacking software already. Uh, would, you, would you say that's accurate? Yeah, I think the, um, the ability to self-learn is uh, critical. And the actual skill sets that uh, kind of drive you apart from the, the others are not so much about knowledge, but it's more about approaches and more about like uh, having the right uh, hacker mentality uh, and the creativity required to find unique bugs. So those are the kind of skills that translate well between uh, different fields and knowledge gaps are not very hard to close, right? Uh, once you have the capacity to learn, then that, that's always solvable. That's what we always do. Right. Yeah, but you still learned extremely quick, man. April, that's less than a year since you've been doing this. And now you've been, you know, crushing it on Code Arena and then um, on Immunify as well. So, yeah, pretty, pretty awesome to hear, man. Um, yeah, thanks. Yeah, it's, it, it feels uh, quite fast. But yeah, like, like you said, like um, I have this entire background to lean back on. And um, yeah, it's definitely helped a long way. So I, I wouldn't say that like I, there's some people that actually started from scratch and are doing extremely well, like uh, uh, 52 is doing really well and he I don't think he had any background experience I heard from somebody. So I have a lot of uh, admiration for people that are joining without uh, even any security related background and finding very unique bugs. So I, I wouldn't say that uh, this makes me some like really unique in that perspective. So. I was able to quickly learn like, uh, to bridge the knowledge gap, but uh, th the tools were already there from before. Right, yeah, uh, that's really surprising because um, a lot of the people I spoke to this year that's doing really well in the space, uh, they've all started uh, like pretty much this year. Uh, they've all started you know, relatively uh, late, um, I guess, and uh, quickly climbing that leaderboard and doing very well. So yeah, pretty inspiring to hear, I think. Um, a lot of uh, some people who who are sort of wondering uh, or questioning whether they should get into the space, um, like hearing these stories, um, definitely motivates um, those people uh, to try their hand as well. Yeah, I agree. Like uh, you can kind of feel that Web three is a little bit different from traditional security. Also, in the like, uh, what kind of uh, technical skills are required to even get started, right? So. In Web3, you don't have to know exactly, like you don't need to be very, very sharp and low level understanding of systems. Uh, you can kind of focus more on the logic level. And if you understand uh, the business, business logic well um, of applications, you might find bugs even without like all these, like uh, all this theory of knowledge that you have to acquire for uh, iOS hacking. So it's definitely a place where like if I would start learning security in 2023, uh, this would be like the field where it's worth concentrating on. Uh, and you'd be able to see some uh, results and like wrap your head around bugs much faster than in other fields. Right. Yeah, that's that's pretty good to hear. Um you know, you you just uh, recently started doing this and then transitioned very well and um uh, did you do any like previous bug bounties in traditional cybersecurity? Uh, no, I, I haven't actually done any. Uh, I've, I've done some CTFs with. Uh, actually, we had a CTF uh, group in uh, in NSO, and we really enjoyed uh, doing that every every couple months. We just like uh, spend the weekend or like a couple of days, and uh, we even got like uh, approval from the management to do CTF on uh, weekdays uh, sometimes. And it was that was that was a lot of fun, and like traditional bug bounties, uh, I've I've had actually I've tried doing them like a couple of months ago, and um, they're very different. And uh, it seems like it's you work much harder and you get much of a lesser reward than in Web three. Uh, 
probably because there's so many more uh, other guys that are doing it and that are uh, familiar and it feels like the trade-offs aren't really there uh, that are, that make it worthwhile to do web 2 hunting uh, unless you're doing it with like a very like a scripted and automatic process uh, so yeah th there's it's definitely a much more mature field and it's harder to to get that like a sense of achievement pretty quickly as you can in you know uh, decentralized auditing and immunify you know it's never easy like there's people that can it can take like a month or two before you really get your result out but uh, it feels like uh, it's it, it, it's more achievable and once you do get a reward and immunify it's usually like a couple of tens of K like uh, ten thousands of dollars or uh, stuff like that and uh, in web th in web two, the, like the the high end of bounties is like the low end of web three bounties. So from in terms of like uh, uh, if you're doing it full time, it's going to be pretty hard to do it in web two right now, unless you're already pretty damn good at it. Yeah, yeah, I think I agree with that. Um, a lot of the people who are good at web two, um, they've got their automation set up, and then a lot of it's like enumerating out the the tax surface and. That stuff I, I don't really find too interesting, to be honest. Like, I just want to look at the code and just start like, <laughs> like, like looking at the logic of things, right? Rather than like spending in time, I'm um, trying to enumerate out the stuff. Um, yeah, it, it just seems a bit more interesting to me. Yeah, it feels like a different set of challenges, and some people are more interested in like those kind of challenges, uh, and feels like uh, we're more of a logical like, uh, let's get down to the code and see like how it misbehaves, rather than. Uh, uh, doing a better algorithm to scan out the directory and so on. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so you, you mentioned um, some of the learning resources, like how you learn Web3, you just uh, read the past order reports and the postmortems. Um, was that pretty much all you did, just with taking your background um, already um, in exploit development, uh, just reading order reports and postmortems, that's pretty much all you needed to do to get up to speed very quickly. Is that pretty accurate? Well, at first I tried to get good fundamentals of blockchain technology. So I even started by having a good understanding of Bitcoin. So there was this website, uh, Learn Me a Bitcoin, which uh, teaches you Bitcoin from scratch, like all different uh, uh, components involved. So I started with that, then wanted to understand uh, Ethereum as it's like most, uh, most of uh, blockchain technology is built on EVM. So uh, I went over the white paper and the yellow paper, uh, tried to understand it to a very deep level. Uh, this is the kind, the kind of thing I also do like uh, in previous, uh, uh, in my previous jobs, right? Like trying to understand some technology pretty well before uh, trying to break it. So um, also reading the Solidity docs from front to back, uh, reading it all. And also they have some cool uh, security considerations which are embedded inside the uh, actual documentation which, is, which can give you some certain directions of like where are potential soft spots. Um, I also had like a remix running in the background and anytime like you don't understand how something works, you can code it up and like uh, see it for yourself. I think it's important for everyone to have like some kind of setup where they can validate their ideas pretty quickly. Um, other than that, you know, like there's a lot of uh, uh, financial knowledge that I didn't necessarily have to begin with. So you, you just read the relevant resources, right? Like Finematics videos or uh, an, uh, an Investopedia articles or anything that uh, you feel like uh, covers the concepts pretty well. And also, one more thing I, I did was like uh, try to choose the, the biggest uh, Web3 names, like uh, the, all the technologies that are at the, uh, at the core of Web3 and reading the docs about of each of them to feel confident that you like, I kind of know what the overall, uh, um, uh, basically what, what they're solving and how they're solving their, ish their, like, uh, their problems. So, uh, the biggest lending platform, the biggest uh, uh, like chain link uh, maker. So I, I kind of uh, read all the docs from their websites and that c kind of gives you the confidence that you know what's up and once you get the, this uh, stuff 
um, wrapped around your head like uh, you can understand the the more uh, modern and fresh stuff that's coming out yeah nice nice so it sounds like you pretty much used the normal quote-unquote learning resources that everyone um, uses and there's really no magic bullet to it it's just uh, you know t uh, going through the steps and then um, with like your background and then actually absorbing the new concepts uh, around like financial and blockchain and it really sounded like you started from the beginning like learning what is Bitcoin what is Ethereum um, and did you find um, the financial aspects of this particularly or more difficult to grasp than some of the technological aspects because uh, I, I've spoken to some like devs and they they told me the financial aspects were were sort of troubling them yeah um there are some financial concepts which are even like kind of new inside web 3 like they basically like some of them don't exist much in web 2 like uh, some perpetual implementations and uh, it's kind of uh, uh, difficult to really understand them and yeah sometimes you spend more time uh, getting like understanding financial concepts uh, than the technology like I did an audit last week on like uh, uh, hedging strategies and uh, at the beginning, I had very little idea of like how they're like doing a delta neutral strategy, and yeah, I spend more time understanding hedging than uh, their specific code base. But you know, it's important to to know what you're studying because, like, on a logical level, this is like a the building block which is which they're building a platform on. And if the like sometimes you can find uh, bugs in the financial level, like. Uh, Logically, they're not doing something that is protecting like uh, what the, the core idea is behind the like the financial core idea. So it's always worth understanding like the the, um, the, the fundamentals, the like the financial concepts behind it. Yeah, 100 uh, percent. Like I, I remember when I first started uh, looking into like Code Arena and some of these code bases, um, it was a lot of financial aspects. And I, when I couldn't understand that aspect, it didn't really make sense like what I was looking at. Um, so yeah, uh, definitely um, that plays a part in sort of like understanding the system as a whole um, to, uh, to give you more ideas uh, to work with during your audit. Yeah, I agree. Uh, it's usually worthwhile understanding it and <clears throat> you can if you're here to like uh, be interested in like long term rather than like uh, there's a lot of people which are like just trying out a, a, a weak competition and see if they even like it uh, and then they decide if they want to join the field or not but if you do want to join I think it's worthwhile to like do it methodically and spend your time uh, getting uh, a, great, uh, a greater depth of knowledge and then like uh, trying to solve the specific uh, contest or bug bounty and this knowledge will translate later on to other projects uh, so I think it's definitely worthwhile uh, to to spend that time even at the expense of like immediate progress yeah yep that's a that's a pr pretty good approach um, I think um, so let's talk a bit about your order process uh, uh, on your website, you actually put it pretty eloquently. Uh, hacking software is just coding in a programming language where the instruction set is the union of all external surfaces of a system. Uh, I thought that was just great. It <laughs> really gave me some food for thought. And uh, I guess based on that, uh, is it fair to say that the first step of your audit process is try to understand uh, like the whole system uh, well enough to the point where you're able to sort of like tease out these extra bits of instruction sets um, that maybe the developer themselves uh, weren't aware of. Right. So um, one of your end goals when you audit like a manual audit, you need to understand where is the where are the points where the developer hasn't completely like. Uh, understood what they're doing in terms of the, the repercussions the um, like any sort of uh, nuances that they may have missed right so they may think that a, a certain API does something but if it uh, receives a different input it does uh, something else so you, you try to, you're basically trying to tinker with it and find some spots where uh, developer assumptions you can falsify them and, and then that's like some kind of uh, a base idea okay what can I add to this sort of weirdish behavior to make it more of a, uh, a material impact something that you can actually feel in and maybe it can lead to a loss of funds or it can uh, 
uh, make a contract stuck or whatever. Um, so I would like I always start by reading the docs and having a very good overall understanding of the system. Uh, sometimes even I go one step further and I look at it from a user perspective. So how do they even advertise this product? What what are users supposed to do? Are they supposed to just uh, stake and unstake? Can they reap rewards in a certain way? Um, there's like uh, you might want to consider it from a user perspective to get a better understanding. Uh, and like after you do all the reading up, then you start reading the code base and um, take a look at it from, uh, like you said, what, what is the, all the external facing uh, API, right? Like what are you actually allowed to wire in? I, like what kind of contracts are the, um, what kind of uh, functions you can, uh, send data to uh, and basically this is your uh, initial uh, grasp and uh, like grip into the contract and from there on you can start thinking okay so if there's an internal uh, function that comes from this external function and these parameters are copied into it so now you have control over these internal uh, parameters and most of the the auditing work is trying to get this really complex uh, uh, diagram, like a uh, mental map of how, uh, like you start drawing arrows between all of the different things you can input to the system and where do they lead. And they lead to other calls inside the system and they lead to changes of state. Uh, and once you have like a really good understanding of what the possible changes of state and, and what, are the con what control do you have, then you can might you, you can start drawing additional arrows between states that the developer didn't have in mind, and this is like the start of bugs, right? When you can get the system to a state that it's not supposed to be in. Uh, so uh, it takes a lot of time, and uh, sometimes these arrows are very very well concealed, right? Uh, you might need to read the docs of uh, a very specific. Uh, um, external requirement of the of uh, a system, and it, th these errors might only be theoretical, and you can, you don't actually have enough control over the parameters to do it. But sometimes, and then you can start to being more creative and uh, uh, trying to uh, do some extra uh, efforts ch and try to see if there is a different way to do the same thing. If um, if there's like a specific combination of, of uh, operations that reach this something that it would normally not be even possible. So you're really trying to stress out the system from a lot of different perspectives. Uh, and eventually, usually you find something and then you have to um, uh, try to maximize the impact of any particular irregularity that you find. And that's part of what you do in, as a as a, an offensive researcher, right? You you get like you, you get some weird behavior, and you keep expanding it until you're able to lead to a, a higher impact, maybe a medium severity or high severity impact. Yeah. So um, essentially, you you build a mental map uh, with code, uh, reading the docs um, or tools like visualization tools. Um, consider the perspectives from different actors, and then check the developer assumptions and then once you put all those together um, you sort of start to form some ideas of what you can do with the code and what sort of assumptions maybe the developers didn't think about in the first place um, and start forming your exploits uh, from there yeah r right and like you need to reach a certain level of understanding of the contract in order to challenge it in the way that's required to find bugs right so i always tell my students you need to understand the system well enough to explain to your body how the contract works from scratch from scratch uh, so if, if you if you still have those uh, uh, gaps of knowledge where you kind of can't explain how it works it just does then you might need to get back in there and uh, and relook at it and take a, and like this way you might be able to find some stuff you missed before uh, so uh, the way I approach it is is first uh, to do like a uh, uh, one pass of the system and like seeing uh, like the different files and work my way from the external contracts into the internals and sometimes uh, I would hop into 
uh, like if there is some concept I don't understand, I might hop into like a very specific like internal function that actually does the uh, calculations to to understand that and then hop back out to the external code. Um, and I keep writing down the notes and uh, seeing uh, maybe I can jump back to this later once I have a better understanding of a different component. Uh, and once I finish this, uh, this process, uh, there is like an introspection uh, stage where you, you're like, okay, and now I understand the code very well. Now let's uh, start making like, uh, like doing some brainstorming. What, what happens if this goes wrong? What happens if this goes wrong? And um, usually I get my bugs after having the, a good read of the code, right? It's not necessarily during the, the reading stage where you have your ideas. It's in the reflection stage where um, you're able to uh, come up with more sophisticated attacks that leverage your understanding of the system as a whole. Uh, those are what, the, the, that's the kind of th uh, process where you can find the more deep logical bugs which the, aren't in a specific line but in a specific uh, process or in a state of mind that the developers were in. Right, yeah, so a big part is trying to understand the project as deeply as possible. And uh, I guess like for myself and a lot of other people as well, um, that is, I, I guess that is a roadblock um, in, in a sort of way because uh, it takes a long time to sort of get that deep understanding. Uh, does that sort of come easier over time, like as you um, understand more projects and, and sort of like what are your tips to, um, for people just trying to like understand a project uh, deeply, like more faster or, or something along those lines. Yeah, so it definitely improves over time and it will translate well once you like have an audit experience of a certain category of product and then you can uh, take a look at another bug, like another audit of a different, of like a different uh, uh, service, but it usually does the same thing behind the scenes. So, uh, for example, an NFT marketplace uh, will usually be similar to another NFT marketplace. So it really cuts down on the knowledge barrier that's required to like get into it. And then you can start focusing on the very, uh, very specific implementation differences, right? The, maybe they handle the, the mapping structure a little differently. And uh, your previous audit will help you in finding uh, bugs potentially in the new one because you can see what, what kind of uh, checks there were previously that maybe the new one doesn't do so well. Or maybe uh, structures that... Uh, uh, trim out some important data that should be there. Uh, so it, it, it's definitely something that translates uh, across new audits and there is and even without like being in a specific category but like on a general level you have more you, you're, you'll be able to grasp new code better uh, the more you do it right It's like uh, it's a, a bit of a, a skill that you develop over time and right. Uh, you you it's like a, you you can basically decide to do it uh, uh, and spend more time even though you might uh, uh, not even finish the contest in time but uh, it will help you uh, develop the skill of understanding code better uh, and usually you'll get better results than uh, just submitting the very trivial findings that others will like maybe the safe unsafe transfer like anything that's uh, uh, easily scannable. Right, that's not gonna make you. That's not gonna be any unique finding. Yep, that definitely is helpful to hear. That um, the more you expose yourself to projects, learn uh, some more patterns, uh, it gets easier over time. You can do it a bit faster, and um, in that sense. So, like when when I was doing C four contests, I always felt like the time crunch, and uh, and I was working a full time job at the time, just doing C four part time. So, uh, because of the limited time, I wasn't able to like um, dig as deep as I would like to. And now that I got a job at an auditing firm, I really feel that luxury of like slowing down, like you said, trying to understand um, everything. And yeah, that definitely feels like a better approach. And um, I guess. So, so your recommendations for people doing C4 is just to slow down. And even if you don't find any bugs for like the first five contests you do, um, that process of learning that project um, 
at a higher or, or deeper level is going to translate to future projects and that's probably like the better approach uh, to this whole thing yeah i think you're right and if people uh, like take a time to read audit reports and look what what are the issues that are very rare and actually get the higher payouts uh, that's going to be the ones that you don't just glance over the code and uh, see it right it's like requires some greater understanding so i would say that this kind of proves that it's it's probably worthwhile to spend the extra time even though uh you'd want to like uh uh, double time and do two contests uh, and like uh, if they're running simultaneously you might want to give up on one of them and just focus on uh, dig like uh, doubling down on one of them yep that's definitely a good tip yeah and over time like I definitely like the line of the line of code count that you're able to uh, go over it increases uh, also sometimes it does decrease because like I've figured out for myself that um, sometimes I can glance over code faster, but with the additional knowledge I've gained, I'm actually, I need to slow down sometimes because there's more uh, nuances to consider. So you can, so sometimes it, it goes back full circle and you still, now it takes you longer to go to look at code, but with the, under, well, but with the ability to find better bugs than before. So I don't, I don't think that uh, the right mentality is to be concerned about speed necessarily, but it's about quality and the speed will come as you get, as you grind out more, but the, the quality will never improve if you don't consciously decide to spend more time on it. Right. Yeah. So if, uh, if say, for example, someone completely new to um, C4 and auditing, when they start on C4, just slow down and take some time to get that deeper understanding first before just going in and start submitting those uh, you know low hanging fruit bugs which probably you know you're getting paid like dollars and cents these days for those low hanging fruit bugs there's not much point <laughs> in doing that uh, right yeah yeah i think so too and like even i can give you a tip about uh, uh preparing submissions uh you might want to wait to, to your last day to make uh, to submit your findings because by the end you might have better understanding of the system and even able to maximize the finding to uh, like a new attack path uh, and i've had some like chances of like i could submit something as low but at the end of the day like at the end of the contest i was always able to make this low a medium uh, because of like a better understanding of other parts uh, so it might be worth noting down every anything of um, anything of value that you already find, but wait for the last day to really uh, sum, summarize it all and try to build the, all the things you found into a submission. Yeah. So um, recently you have just been absolutely on a tear on Code Arena, uh, like 100K over like 30 days or something crazy like that. Uh, how many hours were you spending like on those uh, particular contests where you were doing really well? Um, yeah, I was definitely working hard, uh, spending, C, C4 is something I've been full-timing since uh, September, a, a little less than full-time, but uh, quite a lot, uh, and yeah, basically in September there were like three contests that ran together, basically, like Holograph, Trader Joe, and, uh, and uh, some other contests, and they were... And basically, I thought like it's actually like a lot of contests to run in in, in at the same time, which uh, maybe like other people don't have time to go over because if you're doing it full time, you have the luxury of getting into much more contests and like you can split your time uh, and still have time for different contests. Uh, so uh, I really doubled down and like went on a 12 day, basically no sleep, no, uh, <laughs> no food. <laughs> Uh, try to like kill all these contests uh, and I was actually lucky enough that these were uh, during the days where like uh, uh, the uh, duplication penalty was very high uh, what this means in C4 is that uh, if there's a lot of re different reports on the same issue they cut down the bounty uh, for that issue very hard so if they're like uh, unique findings get paid proportionately much more than they should uh, and I was uh, lucky enough and uh, aware enough uh, to find some good, some cool, unique findings there. So 
I really enjoyed reaping the rewards of that uh, uh, penalty. Uh, but still, even after the, the, the penalty went back to normal uh, for duplication, I still am doing pretty well. Uh, and yeah, I think it's, there's a lot of hard work involved. It's not just, you know, like, uh, kind of, like uh, hopping on the PC for a couple hours, uh, making those couple 10Ks and go back to gaming. Uh, you definitely, you need to put the time in and you need to uh, make sure the time you spend is actually uh, highly focused, right? Like some guy asked like, a question about uh, uh, how to get into this very focused state of mind. Um, you, you basically want to uh, have like uh, a decision where you spend it, like, you're trying to double down on the time that you spend. And, and try to like not not have any other distractions during that time, right? And um, uh, it is important to have some breaks, and uh, you can't have your entire life be around uh, bug bounties or audits. Uh, it's very good for your mental health and for your concentration ability to do other things. So uh, even take a break and after lunch and do whatever you like and then go back and but the time you do spend you want to really try to minimize out the distractions and be able to have like a, a good uh, consecutive um, like hours to to be able to check out everything you want to uh, and reach the required depth for finding bugs yeah that sounds like a pretty good approach uh, do you do anything in particular, like during your breaks, like exercise or anything like that? Um, sometimes I play games or read uh, and catch up on Twitter and, you know, hang out with my girlfriend. And, like nothing specific, uh, just like, you know, p put your mind off uh, auditing, try to like do something else. Uh, and then you go back with like a, a new, um, new uh, energy levels that are able that that's what you're looking for yeah yeah you, you definitely get that like um, diminishing returns after you you stare at the screen for too long and think about stuff um, you, your brain sort of goes on like autopilot and you don't really like get that creative anymore uh, so yeah uh, good breaks in between definitely helps a lot yeah um, you, you can go back and like finally like some realize something that you've been spending a lot of time in like it just you kind of got tunnel vision because of the time you spend on that. So it's good to be able to like uh, zoom out and zoom in again. And, and that and breaks can kind of give you that kind of thing. Uh, so I would recommend taking breaks, but during the time you spend, don't like uh, every minute or so like have any distractions on like uh, on your mobile or whatever. So try to keep your time focused. So uh, just going back to the audit process again, so I, I read some of your blog posts on your website, um, especially the Oasis platform one. Um, I found that was really great because I kind of like, um, you showed your thought process um, in that post a lot more, I think. Uh, so I guess uh, when you start an audit, you try to understand the project, right? But when you're actually doing the audit, looking at the code line by line, um, is it correct to say that um, when you look at a piece of code, you try to think of it like, uh, what is the end goal I want to achieve? Like, for example, for that one, you, you wanted to call um, a self-destruct on it, right? And then you, and then you work backwards from that. Um, say, like, how could I cause this to happen? And what are the roadblocks that the de developers have put into place, the constraints that I'm working with here? And then, and then you try to, like, think creatively to try and get around those constraints. Um, is that pretty accurate like how you work yeah so there are so many different um, uh, methodologies involved and I try to pick up on other skilled researchers perspectives and implement my own and basically you have all these uh, methodologies working in combination and some of them succeed and some don't uh, one particular uh, methodology is uh, uh, having an end goal like already hypoth hypothesizing what the end goal is uh, of destroying the contract and then working your way backwards and sometimes that's a very useful approach when you're constrained in a certain way and like your control of the contract 
sometimes you'd want to build it up from the from the ground up right so you want to uh, start by understanding uh, the contract better and then building your way what can I do with this problem so there's a lot of um, mixing and matching of different uh, auditing strategies you'd want to use and the more aware you are of what other people are doing, you can start uh, uh, combining the, the strategies. Yeah, nice. Yeah. Um, so, so you mentioned one strategy is start with the end goal in mind, and the other one is to like uh, look at the contracts as a whole and see, see if you can build it from the ground up. Um, are there any other particular ones that, that stand out to you that you find quite useful? Um, so there is, you can also, uh, for example, in bug bounties, you can think about a, a, a very problematic or easy to get wrong pattern and start uh, thinking about what kind of, con uh, of projects might be susceptible to this problem. So this is like a, more of a um, looking at it from a very wide perspective of a category of problems. Um, like recently uh, uh, an Israeli researcher uh, used a, a pwning.eth trick of uh, uh, basically, the, there's like this uh, uh, project that has an issue with uh, delegate calls, right? Uh, like uh, delegate calls in uh, EVMs that aren't in like uh, that are in different blockchains, and, and those delegate calls, they can you can basically print money using delegate calls uh, because the message value is uh, cloned again, and you can look at other uh, blockchains and they can say, okay, so we found this particular issue. Maybe it's a systemic issue with other uh, with other ecosystem projects as well. So you can try and uh, have either your own ideas or existing ideas and see where you can apply these. Uh, and this is kind of like, uh, it's a little bit about looking at the end goal and working backwards, but you're looking at it from a wide uh, intra-project perspective. And sometimes I've had success on by looking at like, uh, looking at a specific problem and how many different projects could actually be susceptible to it and uh, sometimes you'd even want to use like scanners and uh, check all, like, as many projects as possible at a time to see if they're an issue like if there's something that is automatable you might want to automate it yeah and yeah there's a there's so many different uh, perspectives some uh, uh, some researchers are very mathematical focused so I can I can see some pretty awesome uh, uh, submissions in Code Arena um, that are like they they can usually be unique because uh, other people don't have this kind of like a mathematical approach to like certain like uh, lotteries or random generations um, interest calculations sometimes you can look for it and find like something that is pretty very mathematical oriented and that kind of increases the chance that it's uh, it's unique but also it's kind of hard to think about it by yourself if you don't have that kind of background right yeah yeah um, so you, you mentioned like uh, one class of bug and trying to match it between different projects. Uh, I guess that approach would be probably like more suited to something like a Munify where you where you get like really good at finding a particular class of bugs and then you can just scan like the whole of the all the code bases on a Munify and see if it's there. Right, right. So that that's like uh, the place where you might want to do that, and that also you might want to like. Have like a circle, a circle of uh, friends or people that you can bounce ideas off, and they might know projects that are more susceptible to like certain class of bugs that you have an idea of uh, of exploiting, right? So, um, if you can find a way to use other people's knowledge and experience to boost your own uh, uh, findings or like uh, directions, that could be great because you're you're like. Uh, accumulating knowledge and being able to maximize uh, what, what your directions are that way. Yep. Yeah, nice. Uh, so, yeah, you, you've been doing very well on Code Arena. Um, and you also do Immunify as well, is that right? Uh, have you had much success on Immunify? Uh, yeah, so uh, on Immunify, I started in, in July. In June, July, uh, I spent some time on Immunify. Found like uh, a lot of small stuff, like uh, not uh, criticals, 
Uh, I also found one critical, but it was kind of unlucky that uh, the the TVL of the project was very low. And the minimum payout for a critical was like uh, 2000. It's like a low level. So uh, um, I didn't get the kind of payout I was looking for. And and then I came back to Immunify uh, a couple months later when I had some like C4 downtime between contests. And uh, that was like when I, uh, yeah, the, the Oasis Dex uh, project. And uh, I, I was already kind of familiar with it be from beforehand because uh, the, I, I found like a, a bug which turned out to be uh, something they fixed a month later, but I, the contract and the scope in, and Immunify was like linking to a vulnerable version of the bug. So that was kind of unlucky. Um, but yeah, when I found uh, it, and the second time, you know, when I take a second look at Oasis, uh, I already had the familiarity from the first uh, uh, check, and like I was able to see, okay, so then that's the, the kind of things they added, and that's when that's where like I had the idea with the, the delegate call where you can hop into your like uh, another contract which isn't even yours, but it gives you the ability to delegate call again to your own contract um, so that was a very unique uh, bug and and they treated it very professionally and they paid up uh, and paid the bounty like uh, one day later and that was kind of a good experience uh, in Immunify after having a couple of uh, um, uh, disappointing experiences and we also had like a, an experience with uh, Django where we submitted the uh, and the O3 swap uh, project, and that was like a, a definitely a critical vulnerability, which they downgraded us to medium. Uh, I think the I think he talked about it in his own podcast, uh, in his own uh, chat with you, and that was kind of uh, demoralizing for us. Um, but I think it can teach us a lot about like there's a lot of variance uh, in different projects, and you kind of don't know what you're going to get. Uh, and until you've already committed time and uh, found, uh, have the finding. So in a way that you're really trusting the project to fulfill on his end. And I know Immunify is making some uh, good progress in uh, decreasing this uh, risk for uh, hackers. And uh, they're talking about uh, protocolizing some deposit. So we, projects will definitely be able to pay out. Um, and actually, uh, Immunify is, it could be a really awesome platform to hunt in once you have that confidence. And we like uh, during the mentorship uh, that I'm running right now, we already found a uh, high severity and they seem to be willing to pay it out and that's awesome. Uh, and actually, um, I also found a pretty big uh, bounty one week ago with, uh, with Zach, uh, Zach O'Bron, which is a great researcher. Uh, and yeah, we're really waiting to see what the project uh, comes back with, but uh, it's I'm looking forward to to having them fix it. Uh, so yeah, Immunify is great uh, as a, another. Like, I don't treat it as a full time right now because I do like the uh, stability and the uh, very very skill focused aspect of Code Arena where everybody is looking at the same code and if you're skilled you're going to do better than the, the rest of the field and, and Immunify is very uh, there's a great factor of luck involved right so you can choose a, a, an unfortunate uh, bug bounty which doesn't even have a, a, a bugs in the first place uh, and you can be the best researcher in the world but still not find anything um, in order to uh, see like uh, the, the results from Immunify that are representative of your ability, you need to spend a lot of time, right? So you can only look at it from like a half year, year plus perspective uh, and see how well you're actually doing and how your performance is. There's a lot of noise involved and some people, you know, there's people that are lucky on their first bounty and, and there's others that are doing it for months and not finding anything, even though they're very, very skilled. So... Uh, you definitely need to be able to um, deal with uncertainty and that's why I also recommend to people that are thinking about uh, picking up on Immunify and like doing it as a career, you need to be able to uh, um, 
have the the cash necessary to like live off like a couple of months maybe even like four or five months uh, without expecting any pay because you never know when that big hit is gonna be and you and you, you have to like keep your hind, your mind very very focused on the uh, on the code and doing it in the most uh, in the best and highest expected value way rather than um, uh, being concerned about like making a uh, low or medium bounty to have another uh, like a, a runway for a couple more months so that's what I make sure like my uh, students are doing like they they aren't uh, they're coming to it with a very mature perspective and not uh, counting on it to for their day to day but rather uh, as a big as a, as a big reward that may come at a certain point Right. Yeah, definitely. Like, Immunify sounds like a bit of a hit and miss um, when it comes to those bounties. And uh, so you're you're sort of working both on Code Arena and Immunify uh, now. And yeah, pretty exciting to hear that your uh, Immunify mentorship uh, it landed a high severity bug. That that's really awesome. I saw you started that mentorship. Uh, I think a couple of months back was it? Um, yeah, I think it's uh, three months ago, or right about uh, three three months, four months ago. And yeah, the, my, the, the students are working hard. They're looking and uh, I'm trying to give them good projects to look at. And um, there's, uh, there's a lot of guidance involved. I try to like uh, uh, choose the best bounties for them specifically. And like we have a weekly meetup. We do some, like we cover some new, uh, like what people are doing and new directions. And like we even had like a, a cool uh, run like a couple of weeks ago, we, we all did the forgeries contest uh, together, and then we discussed how like what kind of mindset you need to do and like how I approached it versus how the others and try to learn from each other because there's so much learning involved and uh, and it's really great when you do it together as a team. Yeah, that that um, auditing as a team aspect is definitely something that I was missing when I was on C4. And like you mentioned, like auditing as a team before um, we started uh, recording. Uh, uh, would you say you you recommend people to like get a group of people together and just audit um, as a team on C4, just to bounce ideas off of each other and learn from each other? Is that a better approach to learn? Yeah, I, I think if you can get yourself like a group that you trust and like. Um have different skill sets in uh, it could be really good because uh, you're really, it's really going to boost your learning process and uh, it's definitely worthwhile I've also like uh, helped uh, some people that are like bouncing ideas off of me and it's great to have these uh, uh, people and like group where everyone's contributing in a different way and it's really gonna boost your own individual pro process as well. I would say it's really great. Uh, on Immunify, you really wanna choose your uh, friends wisely because uh, like uh, what happens if someone front runs you and like submits the report before and so on. So uh, you do need to trust people, but uh, like the people I've worked with were great and uh, it's always a uh, reciprocal, right? Like uh, if, you, if you help someone and he helps you back, it's great. And those are the kind of uh, 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 people like I enjoy working with and yeah it's definitely something that I recommend like especially newcomers which still don't aren't sure uh, where they want to grow and what they like sometimes you don't, you don't even know where you're missing where you're lacking some strong fundamentals so it so um, being in the group it really helps you see where you're good and where you're not amazing at and that you can actually go back and and uh, improve and do self-improvement after you get this kind of uh, feedback from the group. Mm. Yeah, nice. Uh, so how many people did you take on for that um, Unify mentorship? And are they all working full time on it? Yeah, so uh, we have uh, four people in the mentorship right now and, and there's uh, and they're not full timing it, but it's right about like 50-60% uh, uh, of their work time is uh, allocated to that. and they're doing pretty well like I can see that there's a lot of good progress and they're able to challenge the contracts in meaningful ways and there's 
there's so many uh, bug bounties on Immunify that uh, that get updated or they or new projects that there's enough work for like uh, there's definitely enough work for everyone. Uh, and like you, like we said, it's it's more of a going in depth than trying to cover as many projects as possible. Um, so yeah. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Yeah, this is one thing I'm doing right now, and I'm also uh, I've started doing some judging in Code Arena. Uh, probably about two weeks ago, uh, I started. Uh, I got accepted as a judge and already uh, judged the, my first contest, and this is really uh, a quite exciting and. Um, it's very different perspective than what you have as a as an auditor, right? You, it's like your job is to look at other people's submissions and learn from them, but and also decide which ones are legitimate and which ones aren't. So I was already quite active backstage in Code Arena, uh, in like um, um, stating my opinions on others and also forming uh, standardized uh, metrics for. Uh, judging co uh, particular vulnerabilities so that they would be consistent across different judges and different contests. So that was something I kind of uh, uh, already contributed beforehand, but the next step is actually to judge contests. And it, it's actually quite interesting. And I'm really trying, I want to do at least like one uh, contest or two a week, uh, a month to, to, um, to get a good perspective of what that's like. And there's definitely uh, uh, some unique challenges of being a judge, right? Because you have conflicting, sometimes conflicting uh, parties where the sponsor has their own view and the warden has the, is sure that their, uh, their finding is legitimate. And you need to have like, uh, the courage to take subjective calls uh, that will get scrutinized. Uh, but if you're doing it and you're sure of what you're doing and you get your uh, a very good uh, team of judges to lean back on and learn from, um, I believe it's 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 really good good and it's one more thing to diversify in, uh, which I enjoy a lot. Nice, yeah. Con congrats on getting uh, the judge role, by the way. Recently, um, it, it kind of really goes to show how you approach things because uh, I wouldn't imagine judging on Code Arena to be uh, pretty good in terms of monetary reward. It's more of that um, learning process and just looking at things from a different perspective really because like for a single contest you have like how many submissions like 500 or 600 submissions and man uh, that's going to take so long to go through them all and i doubt like the the reward you're getting is um you know even worth your time um, based on like your successes just as a warden or just uh, bounty hunting on code arena yeah um actually if i get into a very deep focus state i can I I think uh, it's it might be uh, a decent pay. I mean, um, I went over these like 300 submissions for paper contest like in one day, a very very focused day, and uh, yeah, that's like, that's pre sorting. Later you have to do like some more of a uh, discussions with the after his sponsor t has his take and so on. Um, so if you're focused, you can kind of get into it and go through and churn out all these submissions. Uh, but you, but it's also about uh, helping the ecosystem and learning more uh, about uh, like others approach the, the projects because if your job is to look at audits that that could be uh, like pretty cool because you, you, that's that kind of forces you to do it and uh, you can allocate part of your day to do that kind of uh, role and. Uh, and it's great to do it as also as a way to influence the ecosystem, right? And so if there is a way that I see severities should be judged, it, it translates to the actual what, what's going to go down. And uh, it's quite exciting to do it. And um, yeah, I think I'm, I'm going to keep doing it for like the foreseeable future. Nice, nice. That sounds really awesome. Uh, so you're pretty much like working on Code Arena, a warden as and a judge, uh, working on Munify, and you've got your Munify mentorship. Um, and then you've also got your audit services that you are, um, are you standing up your own audit firm and accepting private audits? Right, so I've just started um, about a week ago to do like private audits. So I've, I founded the Trust Security, which is uh, um, basically uh, 
uh, specializing in high quality audit services. Uh, right now, um, I'm the only auditor in this company and I want to be able to uh, help uh, companies that are looking for their direct uh, interaction with like independent researchers. So I would be able to help looking over code. Uh, I've already had two projects uh, completed uh, in this uh, in this uh, uh, way of uh, working, and it's really great because you can really have a more of a close relationship with the project and understand um, their like some things that you may miss as uh, a warden because. Like, yeah, as a, as a warden, you don't have the same, like, uh, relationship and you, you don't need to, like, talk with the and see what's important for the specific uh, customer. Uh, and here, um, also, you get to cut out the middleman and you get to be a direct influence over the, the quality of the report, right? So, um, if, you're con if, I, if you're confident about being able to find uh, all the, ser the serious issues, um, then this could really be a good solution, but it also takes quite a bit of responsibility, right? Because as a, as a warden, you don't really need to find all the issues. You, you're looking for the, the high uh, severity issues that are pretty unique and um, like, even if you miss some uh, issues, it's not really your responsibility. But as, a, as an audit firm, you need to make sure uh, you actually have some responsibility for your clients. Like, yeah, sure, you, you're not, you're not uh, uh, obligated uh, to, like, you're not uh, uh, responsible for anything that you miss directly, like in terms of monetary value, but you still want to make sure that the reputation is good and that you're able to find meaningful results for the clients. So uh, I try to take it very seriously, even on a, a uh, higher level than uh, than like being a warden on C4. And so far it's been working out. I've been finding some nice issues for these clients. And I'm always uh, looking for more opportunities for projects. I got a couple coming up in January. And I'll be, I, I'll keep on expanding the way that uh, I receive uh, private services. Uh, how, how can people approach you uh, for a private audit? Yeah, so, I'm available directly by Twitter or through my uh, my website trustindistrust.com, and I'm happy to take uh, to book new audits for uh, companies that are looking for very high-end uh, uh, audit services, uh, mitigation reports even after the actual audit, and like any if you have any specific requirements and um, if you want to uh, have a security researcher be involved in the construction of your contracts or designing of your architecture that's also something that uh, um, I'll be able to provide and right now it's basically a one-man team but um, once the volume uh, goes higher um, I will start bringing in some new guys like um, people that I know personally that are in the like very high level and uh, like I trust to be very good at doing these kind of private audit um, uh, objectives. So yeah, I'm looking forward to expanding the work done under the trust security label. And yeah, I believe that it's actually very uh, worthwhile to for projects to know who the, the, audit, the actual guys who are auditing are, uh, rather than like traditional audit firms which uh, you basically get for their for the label for the reputation, but you don't actually know who the lead security researcher is or the juniors and there's actually quite a large uh, um, Variance in the skill level of different uh, auditors. So if you really want to ha have confidence that um, That your code is secure. I would say um, Decentralized audits where you know the top wardens are going to show up uh, is a good way to go or directly book one of the leading researchers and, and he'll be able to uncover um, very deep issues in your code so I believe that that's a pretty good way to go forward and, and you can even think about it in the way that uh, 
basically the, the best researchers don't have an incentive to work in a firm, right? Because uh, it's a middleman. It's like a way to get jobs, but uh, there is not as much uh, uh, requirement for them to be at the top of their game because eventually they, they're, in, they're not as incentivized as in decentralized audits. Uh, so I would say that the, the best guys are doing it independently and uh, if you want your project to be secure, uh, it's probably the way to go to, to go to, for the independent researchers. Yeah, yeah. I, I know you have pretty strong opinions around this, like uh, traditional auditing, auditing firms uh, versus decentralized option um, and getting that, um, you know, varied um, sort of skill level of auditors. And it's not very um, transparent um, at traditional firms, I guess. Yeah, right. And um, there's lots of different firms and some of them even are uh, like uh, outsourcing their roles to other people, which are much, much less skilled and uh, I think it's very important to have transparency because um, what you want, eventually what the service you're getting is security for your code and it's an extremely important uh, uh, goal for any project to be secure. Uh, when we've seen some of these crazy hacks we had this year and last year. Um, so yeah, if, if you uh, want to attract the top talent, you'll either have to go through decentralized uh, audits or directly get uh, access uh, to independent researchers. And actually during this, you can actually cut out the middlemen which aren't actually having anything to do with the quality of your security audit, right? You don't need to pay for the, um, like, you know, the Open Zeppelin and Trail of Bits uh, marketing team and the, and all the, their financial guys. Uh, you're getting it straight from the, uh, from, from the source and you're incentivizing the right people which are going to give you the best audit you can. Mm. Yeah, nice. Uh, so do you recommend projects get uh, potentially multiple rounds of audits, like maybe one at a traditional firm and then one at a uh, private or the, and then a decentralized one? Uh, yeah, I think it's, uh, it's quite good for, uh, for projects to get a couple of rounds of audits. Um, I would say that you basically the, the, the big the decentralized audit is going to be like the biggest one and you can expect to get the most uh, 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 value out of because of like the way that there's going to be way more eyes looking at the, your code and the way that like different people have different uh, skills skill levels and like way the ways in which they shine in so I would wait. I would like wait for the like final audit to be a decentralized audit, and like in terms of like before you want to ship, uh, and after the after the decentralized audits, you might want to get a private uh, uh, audit or uh, a mitigation review from Code Arena, uh, and this way uh, you can be pretty confident your code is secure, and yeah, like you, the, the I don't think you're gonna get a lot of value from at the same time having a decentralized audit and like a traditional firm audit, because you can look at it like you're just getting a couple more wardens to look at your code, right? And they're not even sure these wardens from traditional uh, firm are better than the wardens that are already looking at your code. So uh, if, if you're only, if you do want to have like this uh, stamp and like uh, some very good reputation that some of these uh, firms are able to provide, then yeah, you can buy. You can basically buy their stamp, and your project will feel will might uh, attract a greater audience by that security label. But uh, in terms of security proper, you, the the decentralized audits are the way to go, and independent researchers uh, can provide that. Mm. So how about uh, for an auditor's perspective? Um, so for someone who wants to get into the space, um, from their perspective, what would you recommend? Like, should they uh, go on C4 and start like upscaling from there? Or do you recommend um, them going to a traditional firm to, to work and get some experience like working as um, in a team uh, from that traditional job first? Um, what, what do you think is the best approach uh, for auditors? Yeah, that's like an interesting question. And it really depends on like, what their starting point is and like how confident they are uh, in working uh, independently versus as a team. Uh, 
um, I think that for a lot of people, the, having an audit job uh, in a traditional firm gives them a lot of confidence in their ability to scale and grow up their uh, abilities using like uh, being uh, exposed to other researchers in a team and also that stable income uh, it might not be as high as uh, independent audits but uh, it's, it might be very suitable for people that want uh, like that uh, clarity or that peace of mind of like a monthly stable income um, and uh, and for more experienced researchers and people that are able to uh, independently grow their skill uh, and are not sure what exactly they will gain from working at a firm, uh, it might be a better approach to go ahead and do like uh, decentralized auditing and focus on that and see how it goes. Um, there, it's, it's kind of fluid and people can move into and out of audit jobs. So um, it's definitely something that people can try and experiment with without like a lot of commitment. Um, different firms like have different commitment levels, but like I've seen a lot of uh, like uh, hopping around, and uh, it's it's it might be a good way to boost boost your skill as a, a newcomer into the field, definitely. Mm. Yeah, yeah, nice, good points. Uh, so I, I probably know this answer already, uh, but uh, if you would start your career again, uh, would you choose traditional security or would you just jump straight into Web three? Um, say if you're starting your career in twenty twenty three. Yeah, so I would say Web3 is kind of the place to go. Um, it's super exciting because um, bugs in Web3 are like their value is actually so much more severe in terms of like the user experience from Web2. Uh, in Web2, you could hack into uh, people's phones or their WhatsApp, but here you can actually steal money from their bank account. So this is actually even more scary. Um, the field is not mature right now. Yeah, we can we can take a wide look and see where where we're at, and uh, it's not so pretty. So this skill is definitely needed in the field. Uh, the rewards are also already there. So it's about um, like seeing what's um, where is the future going, and if you believe that Web three has a good future and the the price the price you pay by getting into it and like learning everything uh, is going to be worth it going forward and I would say that uh, it's pretty clear that web3 research is the like security is the way to go uh, but I can see like a, a more conservative approach where blockchain is so experimental and you might be like uh, feeling uh, I'm not sure if I want to get into it if uh, this is like a fad that's going to uh, disappear in 2024 or whatever uh, and then people might decide to like go to web 2 uh, which is very well uh, like it's, it's already very mature and it's not going anywhere um, but yeah personally I find the web 3 too exciting to give up on and uh, there's so much things to do and um, both from a ideological perspective and the monetary perspective this is like the place to be for me Nice. Yeah. Uh, I think I am of the same uh, mind on that uh, subject. And uh, speaking of uh, the future, uh, what are your thoughts on AI and uh, chat GPT and how that's going to affect auditing? Like uh, I've used it a bit myself. Um, I, I don't think it's that useful just yet because like I I've tried it for toy examples, right? So for toy examples, I, I put it in there. It's like, oh yeah, I found this bug, like whatever. Um, but if you, you try to use it on a, like an actual code base, it just spits out rubbish. Yeah. <laughs> so what do, you, what do you think about chat GPT and how, how that's going to develop in terms of auditing in the future? Yeah, so first of all, as a judge or as a, an Immunify sponsor, it's going to be like a nightmare because you're getting a bunch of spam reports uh, uh, like gibberish uh, spit out from uh, the sort of uh, chat GPT. Uh, so yeah, but actually the, it's a very, very interesting technology that we're going to see change entire industries and uh, they will, it will change our industry also. Like right now we're, n we're, very, we're not even understanding how, but uh, I believe it's going to um, change in various ways, right? Like the developers are going to start using ChatGPT to generate code more and more uh, because it's actually very good in, uh, in auto-generating of code. And 
we're going to have to deal with auto-generated code as security researchers. So maybe we need to start figuring out right now where are the soft spots of AI-generated code. Uh, I can even imagine some like very malicious folks like trying to uh, influence the the data where ChatGPT is getting its like learning models from and, and, and like injecting bugs over there and making it spit out uh, <laughs> vulnerable code. Uh, that could be like pretty exciting. Um, but um, from a uh, from developer's perspective, this seems to be like a, kind of a game changer already. Uh, it, just like cuts down your dev time. Uh, it's definitely not going to like uh, wipe out uh, humans from the jobs, right? Like uh, there, there, you still need like uh, people to go over the code and to direct ChatGPT to do the required uh, development. Uh, and it's still not good at, uh, at very complex jobs, right? It can, it's great at building out like boilerplate, uh, like templates and stuff like that, but um, it, it won't cover your specific use cases and you're still going to need good devs. Uh, from a security perspective, uh, ChatGPT is just going to be another tool in your, uh, in your toolkit. It's good for certain things and I'm, I'm sure it's going to improve because it's going to be able to mine from so much more data and, and improve its models. Uh, so what we're seeing right now is like, it's just like an it's pre-alpha of what it's going to be like uh, in the future. So uh, it is going to be able to uncover bugs of increasing complexity uh, as we move forward. But uh, there's always going to be more uh, rare bugs, uh, deep logical bugs that it just won't be able to detect. Right? Um, it at the end of the day, it doesn't understand logical like uh, business logic what we expect the system to do necessarily. It's really good at finding um, uh, patterns and issues where like maybe forget a modifier or very structured problems, but it can't get inside the, the developer's head and see if they meant to take an uncollateralized loan or not, right? It's just too uh, business logic -y for it uh, to, to detect these sort of issues. So uh, I would say that people need to be aware of these advancements and like play around with them and see like what's it good at and what's it not like right now it's not really ready for um, and be ready to use it for like as a tool but don't count on it and don't be afraid it's going to uh, take over the industry or something like that it's just going to be there alongside with us yeah yeah, you, you mentioned the soft spots of AI generated code. That is a pretty interesting idea um, that uh, is probably going to come into play uh, faster than like uh, chat GPT finding vulnerabilities. Like uh, the developers are uh, yeah, using chat GPT a lot, um, I would imagine um, now. Uh, but for auditing, I think it's going to still take some time for it to become useful. Uh, but definitely, I, I agree with you. Like it's going to get better and better. Um, and just just a couple of things that I'm using ChatGPT for is just summarizing technical articles into just like a TLDR and just read it before I uh, dive into like the full full text uh, of something. Um, and I can also like ask it specific questions, uh, just paste it the technical article and just it'll give me some like uh, pretty good answers when I uh, pose like specific questions to it, which I, I found pretty good. And also to uh, rewrite some code arena reports, like some code arena reports that just not written very well like even in the final report and when I read them it's just like yeah I don't really um, get like what it's trying to say here but you paste that into chat GPT actually it gives you back like a proper like a technical writing form so you can oh okay I, I can I can understand this report much easier now so so those are the, like the two two things that I'm using chat GPT oh. for now at the moment that's actually a uh, use case I haven't thought about and I might implement that as well like uh, getting it to summarize um, poorly written stuff to like and consume it in a in a good well structured way yeah that could be cool yeah 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 I've had I've had some experience with chat GPT myself like uh, I'm always um, uh, surprised by like the virtual depth it gives you when like you ask them like complex uh, like uh, philosophical questions or questions about itself and its own like sentience. So this is really exciting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. like the first weekend where ChatGPT came out, I pretty much just like spent the whole weekend playing around with it. <laughs> it's a uh, very interesting stuff. Yeah. 
And uh, also, uh, speaking of the future, uh, what do you what are your thoughts on zk and the zk auditing in um, particular? Because I think there's a lot more uh, projects uh, that's going to come out that's going to be incorporating zk in the future, and um, that's going to come down the pipeline. And then we're going to need like zk auditors, right? Uh, do you think that's like a major um, potential like uh, a way, uh, like a path for people to specialize towards to, and maybe get a, a big reward for that uh, to specialize into that? Yeah, I think like it's kind of uh, uh, it, it's it's going to be very very uh, important because uh, it requires quite a different skill set to to do zk audits. There's going to be different uh, mathematical uh, approaches, and you need to be much more specialized than traditional audits. And uh, right now, there's like a massive shortage in this field, and there's going to be tens of projects that are that need to come out, and there's not enough. Uh, talent that's able to find meaningful bugs in this category. Um, it's definitely somewhere that something that uh, if you're up and coming and you want to do, choose like where you want to specialize and this is something that you really want to consider if you if you want to go there because um, I anticipate it being very, very rewarding uh, in the coming months uh, while the, there is a massive shortage in this field. And yeah, looking into the future, like this is I don't. I don't think zk is going anywhere. Like this, this technology is uh, pretty groundbreaking. So, um, it's definitely something that you, you that's going to keep uh, being uh, relevant for us uh, as we progress in Web three. So, um, I can't say much about uh, the technical aspects. I know very little about uh, how it works. Um, but yeah, it's super relevant and. I hope to see people join this field. Would you be looking into my into it yourself? Um, I might as a way of like uh, diversifying a little bit once I find like maybe looking at um, current projects a little uh, boring or repetitive. I might try to like um, rebase into that kind of pla like zk platforms. Um, that's a possibility, but. Uh, I, I have very little idea of the kind of uh, background you would need to do something like that and it might be like something that's not worthwhile to do if you're already well established in some other place but it's more aimed at like uh, people that are really choosing where they want to focus on now and maybe people with a more formal mathematical background uh, so I still don't have all these uh, unknowns figured out to know if this is like a good place to to dig in myself. Mm, yeah, a, a lot of unknowns. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so, yeah, what are your thoughts just like on general in the uh, future of Web3 security around um, maybe the industry as a whole, bug bounties, uh, salaries, etc. Because uh, obviously uh, right now we're getting some pretty good um, upside um, in terms of like rewards, uh, monetary rewards in this industry. Like what do you, ex do you expect that to go down as more people come in or what do you think? Um, basically, if this industry really takes off and uh, w the uh, projects are going to be uh, successful, then I would say that um, there's going to be a lot of like um, dynamics involved and in, like transition of people into Web3, but also uh, TVLs are going to be increasing and increasing amount of uh, projects and new like industries that are migrating to Web3. So uh, I don't think that necessarily we're going to see salaries drop or payouts go lower just because people are moving because uh, talent is moving but money is also moving into Web3 so uh, that might cancel out or even uh, go in favor of like the bug bounties and like uh, audit uh, payouts. I would say that uh, it's mostly about uh, how successful the industry is going to be and that's going to factor in right because it's um, we have very large unknowns about like how well, uh, like, uh, how Web3 is going to get mass adoption in the future. And that's something like, I feel like is going to be necessary uh, in order to, like, really make these projects uh, worthwhile and worth the investment. So we're going to need more than your uh, average, uh, like, crypto Twitter population. We're actually going to need quite a large migration of people. And 
maybe ZK is going to bring this maybe in the next technology, I don't know, but uh, I think web, like uh, security isn't just going to solve itself, like there's going to be new challenges and uh, bugs, in, like more complex bugs involved and the guys at the top of the field will still be making very, very uh, good uh, income from it just because like it's kind of rare and not like and this kind of skill set is required because uh, of the monitor monetary uh, value of uh, projects in web 3 differently from web 2 mm, nice yeah it, um either way it's um pretty exciting field to be in just to see just to see what happens right <laughs> how what, how things develop over the next couple of years and uh interesting bugs um pretty much at like the cutting edge of technology um, yeah I, I'm I'm really glad that I found my way into this industry and uh, you probably uh, do so as well yes I'm really excited about it like uh, also yeah you're mentioning about uh, how these like new bugs are going to be like some guy on Twitter has like talked about how uh, in a post ZK world we might not even be able to detect hacks because like they're all done in zero knowledge <laughs> so <laughs> we don't know oh, who dead. did it <laughs> We have no tools to like investigate. Like, there's really no traces of these uh, hacks to work with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that <laughs> that that is a very good point. Yeah, very interesting um, idea. Um, have you uh, have any final um, things you want to say uh, to the audience? Um, maybe to to beginners getting into this industry. Um, anything like that? Well, uh, I, I think that uh, it's definitely an industry that's uh, right now flourishing and we definitely need more security uh, folks involved uh, in securing projects. We have, um, we actually are responsible in some way about the future of Web3, right? If we manage to make it secure, that is the kind of confidence that the, uh, the general population needs to do the migration to it. So. I'm looking at our work as like we we make sure we're like the guardians of this world we we have the we, we need to do it right or it might not even take off so this is like something that uh, drives my motivation for the space and uh, if you're looking for something that you you can excel in and the skill ceiling is very high you can get extremely good at it if you put the work in and and you're very curious about learning new technologies and this is like probably the best place to focus your efforts in. And yeah, I really wish that uh, that more people would join and um, the industry takes off, yeah. Nice, awesome, awesome. Yeah, so it's been a pleasure chatting with you, man. Um, you've shared a lot of valuable insight. Um, I found it really useful um, for myself um, and I'm sure the audience uh, will uh, find it really insightful as well. Uh, so if people want to reach you for any private audits, um, I'll, I'll put your Twitter and uh, website in the video description uh, down below so people can reach out to you um, around that. Uh, so yeah, yeah, man, it's, it's, been, it's been a pleasure. Thanks, thanks for coming onto the channel and having this amazing chat. It was my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. And yeah, can't wait to find more bugs to find uh, to have and uh, and more projects to look for. So thank you very much.